<laughs> What's up, royal family? It's your girl, Majesty, and I'm back with another video. So, today's video, of course, is another ASMR, but I'm going to be doing something different. I'm going to be reading y'all a bedtime story. I was going to try to start soft spoken, but I might try to do the whispering. So I'm gonna bring the mic a little bit closer. Well, you know what? I think this might be okay. This might be all right for y'all. So if I can stay in his voice, that'd be cool. But I wanna read y'all this bedtime story. I bought this book at Walmart. This video, this going this is going to be broken down into like so many different parts if this really gets a good reaction that I expected to get because of the fact that it's a long book to read so this is going to be multiple videos like on something like y'all come back and I'll read y'all y'all bedtime story and everything so yes that's what we're going to do okay y'all ready let me put the mic up close <laughs> This book is called Then She Was Gone by Lisa Jo. Laurel let herself into her daughter's flat. It was even on this relatively bright day, dark and gloomy. The window at the front was overwhelmed by a terrible tangle of Whitster, while the other side of the flat was completely overshadowed by the small woodland in back on two. An impulse by that's what it had been. Hannah had just got her first bonus and wanted to throw it at something solid before he ever paraded. The people said, <clears throat> excuse me, the people she brought the flat from had filled it with beautiful things, but Hannah never had the time to shop for furnishing. And the flat now looked like a sad post divorce downsizer. <clears throat> the fact that she didn't mind mom coming in when she was out and cleaning, it was proof that the flat was no more than a glorified hotel room to her. Laurel swept by force of habit down Hannah's dangling hallway and straight to the kitchen where she took the cleaning kit from under the sink. It looked as though Hannah hadn't been home the night before. There was no cereal bowl in the sink, no milk splashes on the work surface, no tube of mascara left, half opened by the magnifying makeup mirror on the windshield. No, oh, no, on the windowsill. A plum of ice went down Laurel's spine. Hannah always came home. Hannah had nowhere else to go. She went to her handbag and pulled out her phone, dialed Hannah's number with, with shaking fingers and fumbled when the call went through to voicemail as if it, as it always did when Hannah was at work. The phone fell from her hands and towards the floor where it caught the side of her shoe and didn't break. Shit. She hit, She hissed to herself, picking up the phone and staring at the blindly shit. 
<laughs> she had no one to call. No one to ask. Have you seen Hannah? Do you know where she is? Her life simply... Her life simply didn't work like that. There were no connections anywhere. Just little islands of dotted, of dotted here and there. It was possible she thought that him. Okay, read the book like y'all can't see what I'm reading, but it's good with the light. Y'all still there? Are y'all almost asleep? Let me know if y'all like the story so far. It was possible that she brought, that she thought that Hannah had met a man, but unlikely, Hannah hadn't had a boyfriend, not one ever, not one ever. Someone had once mooted the theory that Hannah felt too guilty to have a boyfriend because her little sister would never have one. The same theory could also be applied to her miserable flat in non-existent social life. Okay. Laura knew simultaneously that she was overreacting and also that she was not overreacting. When you and the parent of a child who walks out of the house one morning with a rucksack full of books to study in a library a 15 minute walk away and then never came home again then there is no such thing as overreacting <clears throat> the fact that she was standing in her in her adult daughter's kitchen pic picturing her dead in a ditch because she hadn't left a cereal bowl in the sink was perfectly sane, re sane and reasonable in the context of her own experience. She typed the name of Hannah's company into a search engine and pressed the link to the phone number. The switchboard put her through to Hannah's extension and Laura held her breath. Her... Mm, her through to Hannah, oh, uh, Hannah Mack speaking, there was her daughter's voice, briskate, mm, brisky, and characterless, hmm, characterless, that's terrible, Laurel didn't say anything, just touched the off button on her screen and put her phone back into her bag, ah, uh, she got mad. She was like, why are you not answering the phone? Why you do this to me? I don't got scared for nothing. Okay. She opened Hannah's dishwasher and began unstacking it. Okay. What Laurel's life been like ten years ago when she had when she had three children and not two? Had she woken up every morning and suffered with existential joy? No, she had not. Laurel had always been a glass half empty type of person. She could find she could find much to complain about and even the most pleasant of scenery of scenery, of scenarios of scen ah, of scenarios of scenarios. Scenarios, there's go. Scenarios, uh, scenarios, and could um, and could condense the joy of good news into a short-lived moment, quickly cur curtailed by someone, by some new bothersome concern. So she had woken up early every morning, convinced that she had slept badly, even when she had. Worrying that her stomach was too fat, that her hair was either too long or too short, that her house was too big or too small, that her bank account was too empty, her husband is too lazy, her children are too loud or too quiet, that they would leave home, that they would never leave home. Okay, yeah, that they would never leave home. 
she wake up noticing the pal cat the oh, noticing the pal of cat or smeared across the black skirt she loved hanging on the back of her bedroom chair. I'd be mad. That's why people don't have pets. Pet hair everywhere? No ma'am. Okay. She loved hanging on the back of her chair of her bedroom chair. Ah, of her bedroom chair. The missing slipper, the bags under Hannah's eyes, the pile of dry cleaning that she'd been meaning to take up the road for almost a month. The trip in the wallpaper, no, the rip in the wallpaper in the hallway, the terrible pup, pup scent boil on Jake's chin, the smell of cat food left out too long in the bin that everyone seemed intent on not emptying, contents pressed down into its boils by the lazy, flat, palmed hands of her family. My life. Ooh, I couldn't imagine. That was how she once viewed her perfect life as a series of bad smells and unfulfilled duties, petty worries, and late bills. And then one morning, her girl, her golden girl, her last born, her baby, her soulmate, her pride and her joy had left the house and not come back. And how, and how had she felt during those first few excruciating unfolding hours? What had filled her brain, her heart, to replace all those petty concerns, terror, despair, grief, Horror, agony, turmoil, heartbreak, fear, all those words, all so melodramatic, yet all so insignificant. She'll be the she'll be at Theo's, Paul had said. Why don't you give his mom a ring? She known already that she wouldn't be at Theo's. Her daughter's last words to her had been I'll be back in time for lunch. Is there any of the lasagna left? I love lasagna. Enough for one. Don't let Hannah have it. Or Jake. Promise. I promise. And then there been the click of the front door. The sun dip in volume with one person less in the house. A dishwasher too loud, a phone call to make, a limp scent to take upstairs to Paul, who had a cold that had previously seen like the most is irksome thing in her life. Okay. Paul got a cold. Paul? Paul's got a cold. How many people has she said that to in preceding day or so? A weary sigh, a roll of the eye, Paul's got a cold. My burden, my life, pit me, pity me. But she called Theo's mom anyway. No, said Becky Goodman. No, I'm really sorry. Theo's been here all day and we haven't heard anything from Ellie at all. Let me know if there's anything I can do. As the afternoon had turned to early evening, after she phoned each of Ellie's friends in turn, after she visited the library, who let her see their CCTV footage? Ellie had... Definitely not been to the library that day. After the sun had begun to set and the house plunged into a cool darkness, puncture I hate I hate when the words are like right here and they right there. It sucks for me. Y'all I'm working on reading, so that's why I'm reading this book to y'all. I can't read. <laughs> 
Okay, so the darkness punctured every few moments by blasts of white lights as a silent electrical storm played out overhead. She finally gave it into the nagging dread that had been growing inside her all day and she called the police. That was the first time she hated Paul. That evening is the dressing groom. Gone barefoot smelling of bed sheets and snot sniffing, 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 then blowing his nose. The terrible gurgle of it in his nostrils. The thickness of his mouth breathing that sounded like the death of throes, of throes? Of a monster to her hi hypertensive ears. Get dressed, she snapped. Please. He, he acquites, accused, acquites, acquiesce, Okay, um, he'd acquiesce like a brown bean child and come downstairs a few minutes later wearing summer holiday outfit of strain of, uh, of combat shorts and bright t-shirt. All wrong, 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 wrong. And blow your nose, she said, properly so there's nothing left. Again, he flopped off. Uh, Again, he followed her instructions. She watched him with disdain. Watched him fold the tissue into a ball and stalk pitifully across the kitchen to dispose of it in the bin. And then the police had arrived. The thing that had never ended. She occasionally wondered whether if Paul had had a cold that day, if he had rushed back from work at first call, rumpled in smart clothes full of vim, of vim and urgency, if he had sat upright by her side, his hand clasped around hers, if he hadn't been, if he hadn't been mouth breathing, sniffing, looking a fright, would everything have been different? Would they have made it through? Or would it have been something else that made her hate them? The last page. Y'all gonna have to come back for the rest of it. Okay. The police had left at 8.30. Hannah had appeared at the kitchen door shortly afterward. Mom, she said in an apologetic voice. I'm hungry. Sorry, said Laurel, glancing across the kitchen at the clock. Christ, yes, you must be starving. She pulled herself heavily to her feet. Blindly examined the contents of the fridge with her daughter. This, said Hannah, pulling out the Tupperware box with the last portion of lasagna in it. No, she snatched it back too hard. Hannah had blinked at her. Why not? Just no, she said, softer, softer this time. She made her beans on toast set and watched her cat sat and watched her eat it. She made her ah, watch her eat it. Hannah, her middle child, the different one, the difficult one, the tiring one, the one she wouldn't want to be stranded on a desert island with, and a terrible thought she threw her, and a terrible thought shot through her so fast she barely registered it. It should be you missing and Ellie eating beans on toast. She touched Hannah's cheek gently with the palm of her hand and then left the room. Sounds like an interesting book. Okay, so 
if y'all enjoyed this bad time story, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe, and find me on all the social media. And y'all, we're gonna we're gonna come back with this. I'm gonna I'm gonna read the other part to you. And it says, then page three. Actually, oh, I think that's a chapter. I don't know. It's weird, but yeah, we'll come back. Part three. Well, actually, it's still part two. It's just part, it's just, well, part one, a part, part two, a part one. <laughs> All right, y'all. So, yeah, if you haven't commented first, comment first so your comment get pinned. Be sure to like, share, comment, subscribe, and I'm out.